So perhaps um, as people are joining, I'd just like to start by um, doing an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the, of the lands in which we're all joining today. For me, that's um, the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also uh, welcome anybody from Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander in the background who's joining us today. Um, on behalf of uh, the co-chair of the Pocog Fear of Cancer Occurrence SIG, uh, Professor Louise Sharp, and I, as I said, I'm delighted to, to welcome you all to this um, final session today, which features a lot of really um, talented up and coming early career researchers um, doing exciting um, work in the space of fear of cancer occurrence and, and related constructs like uh, death anxiety, which we're going to hear about first. Um, just a reminder, we would like to um, keep this as uh, interactive as possible. There will be opportunities to ask questions uh, as we go along. So if you do want to ask questions of any of the presenters, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box if possible. That's the little button down the kind of bottom, towards the bottom right hand corner of your screen and that you can click on to do that. And that just enables us to keep track of questions a little bit more easily. Um, if you have any general comments, you can put them in the chat box or, you know, if you want to link to papers, for instance, that are uh, talked about in session, you can use that. But uh, yeah, please use the Q&A uh, if at all possible. And uh, just to let everybody know, we are recording this uh, presentation um, and you will be able to watch it on the POCOG YouTube channel uh, once uh, the session's finished or shortly after the session's finished. Um, so to, to get things, uh, I'll, I'll introduce each of the speakers um, as we go. Uh, and to, to kick things off, we have um, Dr. Rachel E. Menzies, who's a clinical psychologist and a member of the Australian Psychological Society and currently practices in Sydney's eastern suburbs. Um, Rachel did her honours degree uh, in psychology at the University of Sydney and actually won the Dick Thompson thesis prize for her work on death anxiety and its relationship with obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, Rachel subsequently gone on to complete her master's of clinical psychology and her PhD also at the University of Sydney and she's published extensively on the causes of various disorders including depression, OCD, panic disorder, illness, illness anxiety, social anxiety, agoraphobia, generalized anxiety disorder and specific phobias um, as well as on gender differences in anxiety. Um, and Rachel is uh, specifically uh, has a lot of expertise in death anxiety. She's the lead editor of the book, Curing the Dread of Death, uh, Theory, Research and Practice, uh, published by Australian Academic Press in 2018. And in 2019, she released her second book, Towers for the Valley of Death, Reflections from Psychotherapy on the Fear of Death. And in 2021, her third book, uh, Mortals, How the Fear of Death Shaped Human Society. Uh, she's also delivered workshops on death anxiety and its relationship to anxiety and mood disorders across Australia and um, she's currently, in addition to all that, works as a postdoctoral research fellow and guest lecturer at the University of Sydney and I'm delighted to welcome Rachel uh, to talk about uh, why death anxiety is likely to be important for fear of cancer occurrence. Uh, welcome Dr Menzies. Thank you so much, thank you for that introduction as well. Uh, I'll just share my screen and we can get started. Okay. Okay, so today I'm really looking forward to talking to everyone about um, death anxiety and why this might be a really important construct in fear of cancer recurrence. Before I talk about this in the specific context of cancer, though, I want to give a broad overview of death anxiety. So Death anxiety has been seen as a central part of the human condition for as long as humans have been recording our history. And William James famously referred to our awareness of our own death as the worm at the core of human existence. And if you look across every single aspect of human culture, death anxiety comes up time and time again. So in literature, for example, death anxiety is a central theme. The oldest surviving work of literature we have, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is 4,000 years old, for example, 
tells, it focuses on a man's quest for immortality, for eternal life. Religion and ritual are another example of the ways that humans have tried to grapple with this fear. Uh, and art is yet another aspect of human culture which has attempted to explore or solve the problem of death, such as through creating enduring works of art that will outlive the creator. So this is a, a central problem that our species has had to deal with for thousands of years. In 1973, Ernest Becker published his Pulitzer Prize winning work, The Denial of Death, in which he argued that humans have an innate motivation to live, but we also know that our death is inevitable and this can produce a crippling fear. Then the first psychological theory we had came from social psychology. So this was terror management theory, which was developed in the 1980s really as an extension of Becker's work. And terror management theory argues that humans have two main buffers or defenses against death anxiety. The first buffer is cultural worldviews in that we gain a sense of virtual or symbolic immortality by buying into the different beliefs of our culture. So for example, we might buy into beliefs about the importance of academic success or educational achievements or financial success or sporting fame. Um, or even supporting a particular sporting team can be seen as a cultural worldview, or we might have cultural worldviews of a religious nature, such as a belief in the afterlife. So by buying into any of these different value or belief systems of our culture, we gain a sense that we're going to live on through that after we die. The second buffer they propose is self-esteem, in that we gain a sense of meaning or significance or specialness by fulfilling the different expectations of our cultural worldview. So according to terror management theory, death anxiety may explain huge slabs of everyday human behavior. There have been hundreds and hundreds of studies run known as mortality salient studies. These are studies in which people are made to think of death in the laboratory. And these have shown the broad ways that death anxiety impacts behavior. So for example, we know that reminders of death make people more aggressive towards people who hold a different cultural worldview, such as people of a different racial background or a different religious background. Reminders of death also make people want to spend more money on luxury goods. And reminders of death also make people allocate harsher punishments to people who are seen as moral transgressors. So these reminders of death seem to impact a whole range of, of human behaviors. But in the context of clinically relevant behavior, death might be particularly important. So we've previously argued that death anxiety plays a central role in psychopathology in that it seems to be a transdiagnostic construct underpinning numerous different mental health conditions. So if we look at some of the common mental health conditions, for instance, in panic disorder, where people are worried that their chest pain might actually be a heart attack, in uh, health anxiety, where people are frequenting their GP, getting medical tests done, in agoraphobia, where people will avoid leaving their house because they're worried that something bad will happen to them, in the specific phobias, the fears of death are right there on the surface, with fears of flying, fears of heights, fears of spiders, all of which can quite directly result in death. And in subtypes of OCD as well, in the checking subtype where people may be checking fire tops or um, PowerPoints for fear of household fire or electrocution. And in the contamination presentations where people are worried um, about catching some kind of fatal illness. And if death anxiety is this underlying feature of these different conditions, then this could explain the revolving door that's often seen in clinical practice, where it's not uncommon for someone to present with one condition early in life, such as separation anxiety, to receive treatment for that, but then to return later in life with a disorder that looks quite different, such as OCD. So it's possible that death anxiety is that common thread that's underlying those different presentations. And so what do we know about the evidence for this idea? So in a study uh, I published a few years ago, we wanted to know whether death anxiety predicts the severity of different mental illnesses. So we had 200 participants, all of whom were treatment seeking, um, and there were 17 different mental illnesses represented across that sample. So we gave measures of death anxiety and general measures of distress, 
and specific measures of the severity of these different disorders. And so when we looked across the whole sample of the 200 participants, we found that death anxiety predicted a clinician's judgment of the person's distress, the number of medications they're on for mental health, the number of times they've been hospitalized for mental health, their depression, stress, and anxiety, and also the number of diagnoses they've had across their lifespan, which builds support for that revolving door idea. And you can see from the size of these correlations that these are quite large, substantial relationships. When we looked at different disorders specifically, we found that for every single disorder that we had enough people for, there were these, again, large to very large relationships between death anxiety and symptoms of that disorder. And these were for disorders that we might not expect to be related to death anxiety as well, such as social anxiety, depression, body dysmorphic disorder, alcohol use disorder, and so on. We also measured neuroticism to see if that was a confound here. And we found that all of these relationships were still remaining significant after controlling for neuroticism. neuroticism. So it seemed to be quite specific to death. Now, of course, it's just a correlational study. And so if we want to test whether death anxiety is actually causing these disorders, we need experimental designs. And so in terror management theory, the most common design is what's called a mortality salience design. So this is a design where half of the participants are given um, a mortality salience prime, they're made to think about death, and the other half get they're in the control condition. These are the two most common questions used as a mortality salience prime. So people are asked, please briefly describe the emotions that the thought of your death arouses in you, and please write down specifically as you can what you think phys physically will happen to you as you die. So this is the MS condition. In the control condition, the most common control question used is identically worded questions, except asking about dental pain instead of death, um, because they need a topic that is similarly aversive, but isn't going to indirectly make people think of death. Um, and you might think death and dental pain, how can those two things be equivalent? Um, but interestingly, when we measure people's affect in those two conditions, there's no, there's no self-reported difference in their anxiety, whether or not they're thinking of death beforehand or dental pain. And yet, as you'll see, we still notice these big impacts in behavior as a result of the mortality salience prime. So this is the most common design used. Now, using that kind of design, um, they found that mortality salience, so those reminders of death, increase behaviors relevant to spider phobias. So with people with a spider phobia, Reminders of death make them show more avoidance and also higher threat perception um, than those who haven't been primed to think of death. Even social anxiety. So students who are high in social anxiety, when they've been primed with death, they show much more avoidance of joining a group discussion than students who haven't been primed with death. And interestingly, eating disorders as well. So in this study, again, half were primed with death, half weren't. And for women who had been primed with death, when they were invited to join a taste testing task, they ate 40% less in this taste testing task than those who hadn't been primed with death. And they also perceived themselves as being further away from their ideal thinness. So the authors concluded from this that reminders of death are, are pushing women to strive for the thinness that's promoted by their cultural worldview. So even in these disorders that seem not related at all to death, we still find these really interesting findings on an unconscious level in the laboratory. And OCD, which was my honors research. So in this study, we had 132 people diagnosed with OCD. Uh, half of them had the contamination type, the washing type, and the other half had any other subtype of OCD. Um, again, they received the mortality salience prime or the control. Um, and those questions are buried in a larger pack of 100 other questions. And then we told them we were interested in measuring their skin electricity. So we put some electrodes and gel on two fingers. But this was really part of our cover story, because what we were really interested in was how long do they actually spend washing their hands? So then we just asked them to wash the gel off their hands, and we surreptitiously measured how long are they spending washing their hands. And so this was published a few years ago. What we found, as you can see here, that for people who have the washing subtype of OCD, when they were in the dental pain control condition, they averaged about a nine second hand wash. 
When they were primed with death though, this shot up to 21 seconds. So they were spending twice as long washing their hands after this subtle prime of death that they'd experienced about 10 or 20 minutes before. And again, they had no idea we were even measuring their washing at the sink. Um, and so what you can see from these this graph is that it's the washers only whose behaviors are being affected. The people with the washing type of OCD are engaging in their go-to coping mechanism to cope with death, which is washing. But for people who might have had the hoarding subtype or the checking subtype of OCD, there was no change in their behavior at the sink because washing is not their coping strategy to deal with the fear of death. Now, another set of disorders that I wanted to unpack a little more, a panic disorder, illness, anxiety, and somatic symptom disorder, because you'll see hopefully as we go through this task, the relevance to fear of cancer recurrence. So in all three of these disorders, fears of death have been seen to play a central role. In panic disorder, um, someone will feel chest pain and worry that it's a heart attack. Um, in illness, anxiety, they might have a headache and fear that it's a brain tumor. And the behaviors in all three disorders also look really similar. So in all three, people are excessively visiting medical specialists. They have high levels of threat perception. So they'll notice a benign symptom and see it as really catastrophic. And they'll also spend a lot of time scanning their body for symptoms. And these behaviors you can see are, have some relevance to the behaviors often reported in fear of cancer recurrence. So I wanted to use the same sort of um, prime, but looking at these disorders. So I wanted to know, do reminders of death increase the amount of time that these patients spend scanning or checking their body for symptoms, increase their perception of their own body as being less healthy, and increase their intention to visit the GP in the future? So we had 128 treatment-seeking participants, and we had these two different disorder groups. Half of these participants had what we called a scanning disorder. So one of those three disorders that I've just mentioned where they spend a lot of time scanning their body. We also wanted a comparison group. So we used depression because um, we knew that people with depression were just as anxious about death as those with the other conditions, but depression is not a condition where people tend to engage in much scanning of their body. So this was our comparison group. So as before, they got either the mortality salience or the dental pain prime. Then we asked them to do this body, this body scanning task. So essentially, essentially, they were provided with eight different pages like this one here. So to use this example, they were told that recent research has found a relationship between tooth color and metabolism speed, with paler teeth predicting poorer metabolism speed and darker teeth predicting better metabolism speed. And then they were just told to check their own teeth in the mirror and pick which color on the spectrum most closely matches theirs. So what we were interested in here were two things. Firstly, how long do they spend on this page before proceeding to the next page? So how long are they spending checking their body? And secondly, what image do they actually select on the spectrum? Does the prime impact that? And lastly, we just asked them, how often do they expect to visit a medical specialist in the next two months? So do reminders of death make people spend longer checking their body? Yes, we found that the mortality salience did in fact produce longer scanning time, but only for those who had a scanning disorder. So this is similar to what we saw in the OCD study. For people who have panic disorder or illness anxiety, they're using that body checking um, in response to that really subtle reminder of death they've had previously. People with depression were not showing any change on this. Do reminders of death change how people see their body? Again, yes, the mortality salience prime actually affected what image people selected. So for example, if they're told that this end of the spectrum, um, the visibility of their wrist veins is associated with a higher chance of hay fever and this end a lower chance of hay fever. For people in the dental pain control condition, they're picking around the midpoint of the scale as matching their body. But for those in the death condition, they're actually selecting an image which is more consistent with having a higher chance of hay fever in this case. And again, only for those with a scanning disorder. People with depression didn't show any change here. And lastly, do reminders of death make people want to visit their GP? Again, we found that this was the case. So overall, these reminders of death actually increase people's intention to see their GP. 
So in the dental pain control condition, only about 13% of people said that they would see their GP more than usual in the future. In the, in the death condition, this jumped up to 55%. So again, these are quite large effects that we're seeing from this subtle reminder of death completed 15 or so minutes ago. So there's growing evidence that death anxiety may play a causal role in numerous disorders. So these are all of the disorders at the moment that there is some experimental evidence of death anxiety increasing behaviors relevant to those disorders. Some of these are disorders we haven't had time to go through today. But this begs the question that if death anxiety may be at the root of disorders such as eating disorders, um, social anxiety, alcohol use disorder, um, it makes it seem quite likely that this fear uh, is of particularly relevance, particular relevance to fear of cancer recurrence. Uh, and often when you um, read the accounts of people who have been diagnosed with cancer or survived cancer, they will talk quite openly about the impact it's had on their awareness of mortality. So this was just an article that was shared with me in the last couple of days, which I thought was particularly relevant. Um, an interview with a woman who was diagnosed with stage four melanoma, who said that my identity and my relationship with my mortality changed upon that diagnosis. That was the beginning of my new life. So fears of death are often something that come up a lot in these kinds of conversations um, with people who have been diagnosed with cancer. So what do we know in terms of the evidence for this relationship? Well, firstly, most of the findings that have come up on this relationship are actually from qualitative studies. Um, there have been very few quantitative studies that have actually explored this relationship in a lot of depth. But the qualitative studies seem to reveal this theme. Um, so Fusadal interviewed women who had survived breast cancer. And they found that although most women um, who had survived breast cancer did describe fear or awareness of death, it was most described by women who had the highest levels of fear of cancer recurrence. So those who were scoring in the top 5% in terms of fear of cancer recurrence were elaborating a lot more in these interviews about their fears of death. In another study, um, they interviewed patients who had what they considered either clinical levels of fear of cancer recurrence or non-clinical levels of fear of cancer recurrence. And interestingly, death anxiety seemed to emerge as a bit of a distinguishing factor between these two groups. So among people who met that kind of clinical fear of cancer recurrence level, seven out of 10 reported death anxiety or described death anxiety in their interviews. This was the most common theme reported by people with clinical fear of cancer recurrence. And interestingly, in the other group who had non-clinical fear of cancer recurrence, not one of the 30 patients um, discuss death related thoughts in their interviews. So there's this kind of preliminary qualitative data that death anxiety is particularly relevant um, in fear of cancer recurrence. In terms of um, quantitative studies, like I mentioned, there have only been a small number, but what we do know is that death anxiety is positively associated with fear of progression, distress, anxiety, depression, quality of life in advanced cancer. Um, and that death anxiety is also positively associated with fear of cancer recurrence in both caregivers and patients. So Leah Curran in 2020 published um, this uh, proposed model of fear of recurrence. And this was really the first model that explicitly featured death anxiety in and of itself in this model. So they proposed that death anxiety was a kind of crucial factor that hadn't been covered in many other models um, predicting fear of recurrence. And they found empirical support for this model. Um, and again, these large correlations of 0.67 between death anxiety and fear of cancer recurrence. So there's been very little research, um, which again begs the question of why is this the case? Uh, Louise Sharp and colleagues outlined, outlined a few possible reasons. One is that there are few death anxiety measures which have actually been validated in cancer populations, which of course limits research. Um, another is that, like I mentioned, only quite recently has death anxiety been really built into theoretical models of fear of cancer recurrence. And lastly, they raise the possibility that this might also be researchers or clinicians own death anxiety that might have been an obstacle to conducting more research on this topic. Uh, and I think this is also particularly relevant to research outside of the cancer context as well.
So we do need more research looking at death anxiety and fear of cancer recurrence. In particular, what we need is experimental research, which actually seeks to establish causation. So we're seeing this strong correlation in the literature, but do we find that subtle reminders of death increase behaviours that we would expect in fear of cancer recurrence? And also going further, we need trials that are going to test out whether targeting fears of death improve fear of cancer recurrence. Does addressing people's fear of death actually lead to better outcomes for fear of cancer recurrence? So in terms of implications, terror management theory and this growing body of research suggest a very different approach to treatment to our current treatment methods. At the moment, if we think about anxiety disorders, um, most standard gold standard treatments for anxiety disorders don't actually focus on addressing death anxiety. Instead, they focus on disputing the client's probability estimates of a particular cause of death. So for example, um, trying to show the client that they're unlikely to have a heart attack when they notice that, that chest pain or those internal symptoms. That might be the focus of behavioral experiments or interceptive exposure. Uh, or if someone has a fear of, of flying, again, trying to show them that it's very unlikely they're actually gonna die in a plane crash. So it focuses on the specific cause of death rather than actually addressing that underlying existential concern. So we may need innovative treatments to address the underlying fear of death, which raises the question of, is this something you can actually treat? Um, some would argue that death is just a given of existence and it's not a problem that we can actually do anything to ameliorate. Uh, so I conducted a meta-analysis to look at whether that was the case. And it was a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. So this was a meta-analysis of 15 RCTs um, and what we found was that overall psychological treatments did produce improvements in death anxiety, which is obviously very good news. Um, but in particular, CBT was the standout here, that CBT produced the biggest improvements compared to the control condition. So the five CBT studies in this meta-analysis had a heavy focus on exposure therapy. They were almost entirely exposure-based, often in a group format. So we know now that at present, exposure therapy is the most evidence-based approach to treating death anxiety. So what does this look like in the context of death? Well, firstly, it might be anything, anything that's getting the client to face reminders of death instead of turning away. So this could be reading books about death, whether this is fiction or whether these are memoirs. So it might be reading, for example, the first-hand accounts of people who have gone on to die of cancer, for example. It could be tasks such as writing your own obituary, writing your own tombstone engraving or eulogy, such as those um, made popular by ACT. Films that explore death, whether that's symbolically or more directly, um, even children's films that, that explore death, such as the film Coco. Visiting places that the person associates with death, that could be cemeteries, funeral homes, it could be hospitals, if this is something which they have tended to avoid. So with all of these exposure tasks, of course, tailoring it to the specific fears or the specific thing that the individual is avoiding. And technology can be really helpful here as well with exposure tasks. Um, there are apps, for example, um, We Croak is one, Kick the Bucket is another that we've created, which prompts the, the user a couple of times a day with a reminder that they're going to die on their phone as a push notification um, and a quote on the theme of death as well. Again, to try and increase the dose of the exposure so that they're getting these frequent reminders. The central theme, so there are other approaches to treatment that I won't have time to go into in, in too much detail today, but these can also include you know, cognitive reframing um, if you've identified unhelpful, unrealistic beliefs about death. Um, the central theme of all of this work is really trying to cultivate death acceptance. So there are three types of death acceptance which have been found in the literature by Wong and colleagues. The first is approach acceptance. So I accept death because I see it as a gateway to a better life. So I will be reunited with my loved ones. I'll get to go to heaven or, or paradise when I die. Then there's escape acceptance. I, I accept death because I see it as an escape from my current suffering or pain or turmoil. I see it as a way out of this, the, the um, unpleasant conditions of my life. 
And then there's neutral acceptance. Neutral acceptance is I accept death because it's a natural part of life. It's inevitable. Um, I neither fear death nor welcome it. It's neither good nor bad. Now, all three of these types of acceptance are better than non-acceptance. So better than um, all three are associated with less fears of death. But neutral acceptance is the standout. Neutral acceptance is reliably associated with lower death anxiety than the other two, and also with more, with more positive psychological outcomes in general. So the goal of treatment is really to try and cultivate this neutral acceptance of death. And this neutral acceptance of death um, overlaps a fair bit with the philosophy of Stoicism. So I've increasingly tried to incorporate Stoicism into my practice. Uh, Stoicism is an ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, um, or it emerged in ancient Greece and Rome, but modern CBT actually has its roots in Stoicism. Um, so Tim Beck and Albert Ellis both wrote about how they drew on Stoic principles in developing their therapies. And at the heart of Stoicism is this idea that happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things are within your control and some things are not. And so this philosophy of Stoicism can be quite helpful in trying to cultivate this acceptance of death as something I can't control. Um, and the idea of neutral, if you look at the items on questionnaires measuring neutral acceptance, it maps on almost indistinguishably with the Stoic philosophy. The Stoics wrote a lot about how death is neither good nor bad, and that actually embracing your own mortality can have a really positive impact on your life. Uh, they wrote a lot about death because they were living it at very unstable times, both politically um, and just in terms of life in general. So at the time the Stoics were writing, only 50% of children would make it past the age of 10. So there were very high mortality rates and the Stoics themselves um, lived with the constant fear of death because at any point, if they were to upset an emperor, they could be ordered to commit suicide. And this did happen to Seneca, one of the most famous Stoics. So increasingly, the, the philosophy of Stoicism, I think, has a lot, um, a lot of value in terms of informing our treatment approaches to death anxiety in particular. I'm mindful of time, but I want to just briefly talk through some preliminary data we have from our online CBT treatment for death anxiety. So this was developed um, at the end of my PhD. This was the world's first online self-guided CBT program. It's completely standalone, meaning that it requires no therapist input. It's fully automated um, and it's also individualized. So it will, the, the program will create individualized exposure and cognitive challenging exercises for the user. It has seven modules, which include exposure therapy, cognitive challenging, also some values-based work. And we've just finished, um, so this paper here is about the development of the program, but we've just finished um, conducting our clinical trial of 20 participants, all of whom were seeking treatment for mental health conditions. Uh, we're currently writing this up at the moment, but I thought I would just show you some brief data. So these 20 participants were essentially just given access to the program. They had up to five months to use it. Um, and there was no other contact with them from therapists. They just worked their way through the program. So you can see here, this is the data from those who reached the end of the program, so people who we could get post-intervention measures for, that for each of these four different subtypes or subscales of fear of death, we saw these reductions, these improvements in their death anxiety. Because we wouldn't have had the power to detect um, significant or to test significant effects, we used a clinically reliable change score to look at what percent made a reliable improvement we found that 90% of people um, improved on at least one subscale of death anxiety and 60% actually improved on their total fear of death score. So these results I think are quite promising that with no therapist input using this self-guided program, people seem to, 90% of people made some improvement in their fear of death. Um, we also had no adverse events, which suggests that it's a safe program to administer in isolation. And I think this is quite promising in terms of um, something that potentially can be used either along, you know, standard treatment for conditions or in isolation as well. So thank you so much for, um, for today. Um, in case there were any other, um, anything else you were wanting to read on this topic, I'm just going to gratuitously self-promote here. 
Um, given the psychoncology context of, of today, I thought I would just point out a couple of things from some of these books. Um, this is a CBT self-help book coming out next year with Professor David Veal. Um, we've included some characters in this book that kind of you meet at the beginning of the book and you see their response to treatment across the book. One of these characters is a woman who um, has been diagnosed with um, ovarian cancer. And so you see her as a cancer patient, advanced cancer patient, how she responds to some of the self-guided activities throughout the book. Um, in Tales from the Valley of Death as well, this is a collection of interviews with 10 different real patients who have um, dealt with the fear of death in their treatment and across their life. Um, and one of the 10 patients in this book is um, also diagnosed with um, prostate cancer. So those were just two, two things I would flag given um, that today is obviously in the context of psycho-oncology. So again, thank you so much. Uh, and I would be delighted to answer any questions. All right. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, just a reminder to put any question you have in the Q&A uh, box, but I'll perhaps kick off with one while people are <coughs> getting started. Um, I was wondering, Rachel, I mean, with fear of recurrence, we, we tend to see um, higher levels of fear of recurrence among uh, people who are younger. Um, and I was wondering if you saw similar relationships with death anxiety um, and, and whether there are also any cultural differences. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So age, um, definitely death anxiety varies as a function of age on the whole. So generally, probably similar to what you've observed then, as people get older, people actually tend to become more comfortable and accepting of death. So we would expect that people who are elderly and most imminently facing death, you would think intuitively they would be the most fearful, but actually it's the opposite, that that age group tend to have the lowest levels of death anxiety than any other group. So it sounds like it's then quite similar to what's been observed in the fear of cancer recurrent space. Okay. And, and, and what about across cultures? Are there certain cultures where there are, tend to be lower degrees of death anxiety than others? Yeah, it's, it's another really good question. So we know in terms of um, differences in measures, there are, you do sometimes see kind of differences on self-reported measures of death anxiety. Um, you also see, of course, different cultures handling death differently, where in, you know, in a lot of Western cultures, certainly not all of them, there's a real taboo and stigma about death. Um, and it's not something that is often a big part of our day to day life. Um, whereas in, in our newest book, Mortals, we talk a lot about how in many other cultures, death is seen very much more as the, the flip side to life, um, such as in a lot of Central American cultures where they will have festivals celebrating the dead, um, which is obviously not something that a lot of us have access to in our culture. Yeah, okay. So there are some interesting differences across, across cultures by the sound of things. Mm. Um, I was also wondering, I was very curious to hear about the, the priming experiments that you do. Um, uh, I guess with, with fear of recurrence, um, often uh, those worries are linked to, I guess, uninvited or intrusive kind of thoughts about the possibility mm. of recurrence. And I was wondering, I mean, obviously it's a hard thing to test experimentally if you're priming people to have those thoughts, but is there much literature to suggest that the same kind of things underlie death anxiety or how often do people tend to have those thoughts just generally? Those kind of intrusive thoughts. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a, another really good question. So typically the more, um, you know, the more mental health difficulties someone has, they'll certainly have more of those intrusive thoughts about death. Um, from a terror management perspective, they would say that if people aren't having so much of those kind of conscious intrusive thoughts about death, it's because they're using those buffers effectively, that they're, um, they've kind of bought into the beliefs of their culture that have helped give them a sense of significance and meaning. Um, so those buffers seem to be working well for them. Whereas, and, and there's some evidence that for people with mental health difficulties, those buffers just aren't working effectively, where they don't seem to show the same defense or clinging to their worldview 
that we see non-clinical participants doing, for example. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, no, very much. Um, and I can see Joe Shaw has a question as well. Joe. Yeah. Um, Rachel, you mentioned um, just in passing that there, um, there's some research around um, increased death anxiety amongst carers. And I was just wondering, um, do you think there's a different mechanism or what, what is that relationship um, for caregivers? That's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. I wonder whether it's if I hold more negative attitudes towards death in general than the idea of, of losing a loved one, of my loved one's cancer returning, um, seems a lot more catastrophic than someone who perhaps holds more hold more of those kind of neutral acceptance, stoic attitudes to death that, you know, um, it would be awful to lose this person, but I would be able to cope with that loss. Um, that would be my intuitive sense, but I don't know of, of much research that actually looks at that, that mechanism. Hmm. No, no, I think it's a really interesting question. So mm. something we can look to explore. Mm. Maybe, um, sorry, I, I would encourage everybody else on the, on the call to ask questions just so you don't have to listen to me too much. Um, but uh, I was just interest, interested, Rachel, in, in one question about, I guess, some of the um, potentially positive outcomes of surviving a, a, a cancer diagnosis. Like, clearly, there's, there's a subgroup of people who struggle with fear of recurrence and, and death anxiety. But I was just wondering what the evidence is around people who have had like a life um, changing or life threatening uh, illness like cancer and, and gotten through it. Is, is there a subgroup of, of people who seem to have less death anxiety after that because they've kind of come close to death but managed to get through it and, and go on to kind of experience growth after that experience? It's, yeah, it, it's a really good question. So there's this idea of, of post-traumatic growth that some kind of near-death experience whether that's a terminal diagnosis or, you know, a near fatal car accident, for example, for some people actually, you know, for some people it creates substantially more mental health difficulties. For other people, they, they experience this, this idea of post-traumatic growth where it leads to a real shift in their values, their priorities, and actually enhances their quality of life. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure about the data on what, what, kind of personality traits or factors are associated with that that second pathway mm. um, but definitely there, there are people who talk about you know this awareness of death has actually really been a positive thing um, and and that's you know in keeping with that idea of the more we can and I don't want to get on a soapbox here but the more we can kind of be aware of and embrace our mortality can actually help us think a lot more about what kind of life we do want to live with the finite time we have and this is certainly something I try and include as a, a treatment approach. Right. All right. Well, thanks again, uh, Rachel, or Dr. Menzies, for, for all your yeah, very interesting, insightful um, uh, comments and presentation on, on death anxiety and how it might relate to fear of cancer occurrence. Really appreciate your um, getting us off to a great start here. Oh, I've got one more question, but maybe I'll get you to answer that in the um, while the next presentation is happening, just so we can keep to time. Sure. Um, so at least uh, now uh, we have uh, Dr. Tamara Butler, who's an Aboriginal early career researcher and fellow at the University of Queensland, and she works within the First Nations Cancer and Wellbeing Research Network. Uh, her work is focused on women's cancers and improving cancer outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people families and communities. Um, so I'd like to welcome Tamara. Thank you, Ben. And I hope that uh, presentation is showing clearly now. Yep. Well, good, great. Um, and thank you, Dr. Benzies, for that really, um, really insightful talk. It was such an interesting uh, approach to this uh, space. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so today I'll talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work we're conducting and some preliminary work around fear of cancer recurrence among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, so we're talking to a mixed method studies we've done in this space. 
Um, as is traditional, we'll, we'll just start off with an acknowledgement of country. So I just wanted to acknowledge traditional owners of the lands that you're, you might be joining us from. So for me, that's um, Yagara and Turrbal people here in Miage in Brisbane. And I just want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that really important cultural and spiritual connection we have to country. And um, just acknowledge that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So um, I'm sure you're all aware of some of the stats around this, but cancer is a leading cause of illness and death among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. Um, we unfortunately experience significantly worse outcomes um, than other groups in Australia in terms of risk factor prevalence, um, cancer incidence, stage of diagnosis and disease outcomes, including those psychosocial outcomes. So we tend to have um, more advanced cancer at diagnosis and tend to receive um, suboptimal treatment. Um, and there's lots of emerging evidence now around um, the high levels of distress in this population. Um, so, and often this is at odds with the kind of bi biomedical approach to care that's often um, offered in a cancer care space. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a, a preference for more holistic and kind of, um, you know, a care that takes in the whole of the person as well as their, their context and their community and family. Uh, so, yeah, some of those factors there are a little bit out of alignment. When it comes to breast cancer, um, it's the second most uh, commonly diagnosed cancer after lung cancer. We actually tend to have a lower incidence um, than non-Indigenous Australians, but higher mortality, so dying at a much higher rate uh, than non-Indigenous Australians and um, not surviving as long in, in terms of that five-year survival rate. I'm sure you're all aware um, fair Fear of cancer occurrence is defined as the fear, worry or concern related to the possibility that cancer will come back or progress. And understandably, this is a major concern of cancer survivors. It's just when it tips into that really kind of clinical space that it becomes very debilitating. And this can happen for around 40 to 70 percent of cancer survivors. Um, so some of our team, including Ben, um, have done a recent systematic review exploring evidence around FCR for global Indigenous, ethnic and racial minority populations, just trying to find out what that experience is actually like um, for those groups. And what we found there is that um, there's quite a, quite a big gap in the research um, for all Indigenous peoples around the world, um, and especially for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, of the 19 studies in that study, in that um, review, only one investigated FCR among an Indigenous popula population, and that was for Native Hawaiians. So what this really said to us is that really we just don't know much about this um, and that, yeah, we really need to know what's going on so that we can start to support people through this process. Um, so um, in this study, we're using a mixed method, method approach to explore what that means. Um, so quantifying levels of fear of cancer recurrence among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, the women in this case diagnosed with breast cancer, and also looking at sort of um, yarning with these women about what is that experience like and, and delving into those kind of um, that quantitative information a bit more. Um, so for this study, we've partnered with Breast Cancer Network Australia or BCNA. Um, they've been fantastic um, partners to work with um, and really motivated to get some change happening and support this population. So BCNA had a, um, have a database of, you know, all their people connected to them. And from that, we're able to sort of send out invitations to do this study from their, from their database to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Um, and as part of that, which was really nice, they were able to build in some reminder emails that had video messages from elders encouraging participation in the study and personal messages about why it's important and why people should take part. So the survey had um, some demographics, cancer-related information, fear of cancer recurrence inventory um, in it as well. So it had seven subscales, um, and they're listed there on the screen. Uh, and also what we we're interested in there is looking at um, not only total FCR, but also the, uh, the um, severity of that. So was it cl clinically significant or was it subclinically significant? Um, so a score of 22 or higher on that, on that severity subscale being um, clinically um, significant distress there. We had 19 women complete that survey. So it's not a huge study, but because of this, there is just nothing in this space, it really does start to be informative about what's going on. So from that survey, then we invited women to get on the phone and have a yarn with us about their experiences. And so we, with those, we had the kind of responses on the survey. And so we're able to unpack that a bit more. 
Um, so most women, everyone is identified as women in this study, so I'll just continue using the term women. Um, most identified as Aboriginal, around 52 years old, lived in major cities and mostly in Queensland. Um, of meeting of two chronic conditions, had been diagnosed with an early stage breast cancer about three and a half years ago, had completed treatment and had been told they no longer had cancer and had a range of different surgeries, um, treatments including surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So looking at the findings on the inventory, um, so just overall total fear of cancer recurrence, um, which had a possible range of zero to 168, we just had a quick comparison of what else was going on um, and what other uh, studies have been done with um, general Australian populations and how this score panned out in, in, in comparison to those other populations. And as I said, you know, it's only 19 people who did this survey, so it's not huge, but it does tell you something about the direction of the effect. Um, it's that fear is sitting a little bit higher than other Australian populations, which says to us that there's, there must be a need for a greater support and help around this, if this issue for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Um, oh, sorry. Um, what we actually found is that 40% um, or so of our participants were ex um, experiencing this clinically significant FCR. So eight of our participants and seven of those, uh, seven other women were also experiencing subclinical. So just below between the range of 13 to 21 on that severity subscale. So it's very few women who are, you know, really flying through on this um, without experiencing a fair bit of distress, uh, which is troubling. So we also had this um, qualitative information from the yarns. And so we started out with our analysis of this, looking at sort of the subscales and how they sort of all fit together and how they map onto the qualitative information we're gathering, we're finding with some of these um, concepts that they kind of, they really overlap. So we did merge um, psychological distress, severity and insight into one. And I'm sure it will come as no surprise to, to see that um, fear of cancer occurrence is a constant source of worry and fear and stress for women often accompanied with feelings of sort of uncertainty and apprehension about their cancer coming back. Women were talking a lot about, well, will this treatment stick? Like I know I've had a lot of treatment and it seemed really rigorous, but I don't know if it's gonna last. Or will screening pick it up quick enough? Um, you know, that sort of, those sorts of things about, yeah, just this underwhelming, uh, overwhelming feeling of just uncertainty around, is it going to happen or not? Women also talking about um, the impact that they, they're really worried about the impact on their family and relationships. And this is often beyond their own kind of concern for their own well-being. Um, they just really didn't want to see their families to be um, hurt or impacted by the cancer coming back. And they just didn't want to see their family suffer in that way. In terms of triggers and reminders, this is quite wide ranging. But I'll just pick out a couple that um, seemed kind of a bit more unique to this population. Um, so, women have talked a lot about the extensive family history that they knew of around cancers in their family. So not only breast cancer, but bowel cancers and lung cancers and things like that. And so women were sort of going through the back catalogue going, oh no, my auntie had this, my uncle had that, my cousin had this. And that often triggered a sort of fatalistic thinking around, well, how long do I have left to live then? And there was a very, yeah, very, um, you know, anticipatory grief sort of process that they were going through thinking about that. But what we also found is that um, women had experienced and talked a lot about their own personal experiences with other um, comorbid diseases, so diabetes or heart conditions, or their experiences of watching other family um, and kin kinship circles sort of going through that. And so that really direct um, experience or indirect through others' experience of watching a major illness unfold um, really brought that salience of the fear of cancer recurrence um, to, to the forefront of the mind and often thinking about, well, this will, this will result in my own death. So that was um, really kind of a big issue for, for these women. Women also talked a little bit about um, their perception of their, their self-perception of risk um, because they were an Aboriginal woman. woman. So they talked a lot about, um, you know, knowing about the higher uh, rates of cancer among the community and just um, often thinking about that as a risk factor for the cancer coming back and as um, yeah, something that would make it worse. So there was a real awareness of that. Um, so it is important to note there was a range of experiences in this qual data set. So some women were scoring quite low on the cancer, uh, fear of cancer in recurrence inventory, you know, around, um, I think, 14 or something. Yeah, 14 was our lowest um, score, 44. Others as high as 109, 97. 
Um, so there are people who are coping really well um, or just flying by and others who are really experiencing a lot of distress. Um, so we're, it was nice to be able to explore some of the coping mechanisms around that. Um, there was a lot of dark humour around um, cancer and women talked about the jokes that they cracked with their um, healthcare professionals and the healthcare professionals being a little bit like, well, how do I deal with that? Um, but that seemed to be a key way that women coped with it. Um, a lot of com comfort taken in self-examination and routine checkups. Um, and along with that, there was two experiences in terms with trust in doctors and the medical system. So some people were saying, you know, I feel my treatment has been really rigorous and comprehensive. I really trust that. That's reassuring. Others saying, well, look, I've had really negative experiences with the medical system in the past. And, you know, I don't have a read, but I don't know why I would trust this doctor to make decisions on my behalf. And that's really based on these experiences of racism and other sort of negative things that have happened to them in the past and to family that they've observed. So there's quite a um, distinct difference there. A lot of women talking about a very positive or pragmatic approach, um, just taking each day as it comes or getting on with it and not dwelling on the stresses um, and others sort of shifting their frame of reference to make it more positive for themselves. So thinking about things they could be grateful for, um, including, you know, I'm so glad my children weren't um, were adults at the time of diagnosis rather than children, because otherwise that would be too hard to deal with. So really just picking the things they could be grateful for helped women to cope. Um, so some were talking about drawing on culture as well as an important um, coping mechanism. So visiting country um, and, and drawing and painting as, as kind of cultural ways of coping. Um, just conscious of time, so functioning of impairments. This was really around the role that women played in the family. They really wanted to be there to be the, grand, the grandmother and see their grandkids and see those important milestones. So very much um, revolved around their functioning in terms of the family unit. Um, so just this final one, this is an emerging theme that we're still sort of picking through and sort of seeing how it all aligns, but it was, it's really about um, communication and cultural safety in, in the cancer care setting. So women are talking a lot, of, a lot about um, the importance of culturally responsive communication and care. Um, so often women are talking about this experience of follow-up care where um, the doctors seem to be much more interested in what tablets are you taking and how often you're having them and how are you physically feeling. And this woman here with a quote saying, well, no one's ever actually asked me how my, how, how's my well-being? How am I actually doing with this? Like I've just been through this massive thing. Of course, it's understandable that I'm not feeling so great about it or a bit worried about it coming back. So people are really asking for a holistic approach. Um, as I mentioned earlier, looking um, for some care for the whole person rather than just the kind of physical side of that um, cancer experience. Um, women also talking a lot about the need for more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff. This is often around feeling like there's someone you can connect with in terms of culture um, and just have that instant connection with in the um, cancer care setting. Um, but also that, the, you know, there was, was um, you know, liaison officers around, but they're often overworked, overwhelmed, and maybe don't have cancer-specific uh, know-how. So there was a gap there that needed to be filled. And a little around um, cultural safety. So uh, some experiences of hospitals not really getting uh, women's business. So breast cancer is a very women, uh, women's business kind of issue. So having uh, men being treated in the same space or men around um, was seen as quite just, um, destabilizing thing. So just to wrap things up there, I guess, um, as I said, there's a lack of research and a lack of understanding of, of fear of cancer recurrence among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cancer survivors. And so we've just um, started to unpack this a bit among breast cancer um, survivors. Um, and there's a significant burden of cancer. So it's really important that we understand this. Um, it is a small study, but it starts to shed some light on some of the unique aspects of fear of cancer recurrence. And what it is showing is that there is a high level there. Um, there needs to be some extra support. And I guess that's, that's our next um, steps that we're taking with um, BCNA is that we're just looking at how can we um, tackle this? How can we develop some culturally appropriate um, resources and supports for women to use to help navigate this space? So um, thanks for your attention. I'll take some questions. Thanks, Tamara. Um, great, great work and, and yeah, very much needed uh, in terms of trying to unpack FCR for uh, people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds, um, given the lack of research in that space. I've got time for one quick question, if anyone. Uh, Sorry, I did go a little over time there. No worries. 
Um, all right, well, I was just wondering, um, we, we saw that uh, these women were worried about the impact of uh, potential recurrence and, and maybe even their fear of it uh, on, on their family and, and community. Um, and I was just wondering whether you got it, but we know that communicating with, with people about that fear and sharing that fear can actually be beneficial for, for both the survivors and the, and the caregivers. Did you get a sense of um, how openly these women were able to talk about it with their um, family or friends mm -hmm. and, and what the impact of that was? Yeah, I think there was a really strong sense that people try to protect, um, you know, their main sort of person who was caring for them from that fear. Um, there was a sense of like, yeah, they've been through enough um, and this is just kind of, you know, I've, I'm through, I've been told that I'm unclear, so why should I worry? So people really did try to protect their family from it and protect that kind of the, the, the people around them that were in that sort of bubble um, to, from that sort of that, the impacts of that fear. Um, yeah, the kind of the role that the women played in the family came through was a really strong theme and I think that's really um, in, embedded in that, just trying to protect others and, and support others. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks again, Dr. Butler. I will now nice. move on to um, our next presenter, who is uh, Winston Gow. He's a fourth year medical student currently studying at the University of New South Wales, and he's been working with the psycho oncology research uh, team at the Ingham Institute um, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Adiola Bamboje and myself. So, uh, welcome, Winston. Yeah, hello, hello. Um, just checking that you guys can hear me, you can see my slides. Yep. All right, wonderful. Um, so I'll be talking about um, the detection and screening of fear of cancer recurrence, um, specifically about the evaluation and potential of a single item screening measure, um, the FCR1, which has been developed recently. Um, and as Ben said, I was supervised this year by Ben and Adiola. Um, so fear of cancer recurrence is defined as the fear, worry, or concern relating to the possibility that cancer will come back or progress. And one in two cancer survivors experience clinical levels of FCR, which is associated with significant distress, psychological comorbidities, such as anxiety and depression, and a decreased quality of life. It also causes an increased burden to the healthcare system. Um, and yet, despite its high prevalence and its significant burdens, um, FCR remains the most frequently reported unmet need by cancer survivors. And one of the potential reasons for this is that FCR is under-recognized in healthcare settings because at the moment we lack a screening tool that is practical for routine clinical use. Um, currently, the fear of cancer recurrence inventory short form, the FCRISF, is the most widely, is one of the most widely used measures of, of FCR, and probably the closest thing we have to a gold standard self-report measure. It has good sensitivity and specificity but its length makes it a bit impractical for clinical purposes. Um, it is also what we chose for our gold standard for this study. Um, there has been development of um, shorter four and six item measures that may be more suitable for clinical purposes, but both of these are yet to be implemented. Um, researchers have suggested that even shorter one item measures of FCR may be a more practical solution. Um, a one item screening tool has many benefits for example, um, it would have a very low response burden for the patient and also be very easy to administer and interpret by the healthcare provider. Um, and more importantly, because of its short length, it can be easily integrated into already existing psychosocial screening programs, such as the Edmonton Symptom Assessment System. Um, the ESAS is used in Australia to assess for common cancer symptoms and psychosocial well-being in cancer survivors. So by incorporating a single item FCR measure into the ESAS, we can easily integrate FCR screening into routine cancer care. And we think that the role of a one item FCR measure could be to function as a preliminary screening tool of a two-step process, where a positive result on it will go on to complete a more comprehensive assessment, such as the FCRISF. Um, and so the one item measure of FCR, the FCRI, was developed by Roddy et al in 2020. Um, they verbally asked their participants um, on a scale from zero to 100, what is your subjective level of FCR at this time? They showed that it had good potential for use as a screening tool with moderate sensitivity and good specificity. Um, however, further refinement and evaluation is possible. For example, it will be more practical to deliver the FCR1 in written form, and it may also better reflect its clinical application 
to assess how it performs when it is integrated as part of an existing psychosocial screening program, such as the ESAS. And so our first aim was to refine the FCR1, and we did that by de delivering it as part of the ESAS as shown. And once again, the, the strength of this is that the FCR can now be easily screened for with something that is already used in cancer care. Um, it is notable that um, the revised FCR provides a short definition of FCR, along with a visual zero to 10 scale. Um, part of our second aim was to assess the criterion validity of the FCR1, which is comparing its performance against the gold standard measure of FCR. And we did this by examining correlations between FCR1 and FCRISF scores using Spearman's row and linear regression. Another part of our second aim was to assess its construct validity, which is essentially asking, does the FCR1 actually measure what it's supposed to which, is, which in this case is FCR severity. And we did this by looking at correlations with constructs that are known to be related, such as anxiety, intrusive thoughts, and negative metacognitions. And also looking at correlations with measurements that are known to not be related, such as income, marital status, and employment status. So if the FCR1 was actually measuring FCR severity, we would expect to see good correlations with anxiety, intrusive thoughts, and negative metacognitions, and no correlations with income, marital status, and employment status. Um, and our third aim was to determine a suitable cutoff score to screen for clinical levels of FCR by conducting an RSC analysis. Um, so we asked English speaking adults with a cancer diagnosis in the past 10 years to complete a questionnaire. The questionnaire assessed demographics. It assessed FCR with the FCR1 and the FCRISF. And it also had measures assessing for anxiety, um, intrusive thoughts, and negative metacognitions, which were included to evaluate for construct validity. Um, we recruited 33 female and 21 male participants um, who were mostly between 65 to 74 years of age. Um, roughly half were married, roughly half were retired pensioners. And you can see that the sample was quite varied in terms of socioeconomic and demographic factors. Um, from this slide as well, we can see that they had a quite a wide range of cancer diagnoses. Um, and similarly with the disease characteristics and time since diagnosis. And this was positive in indicating that our sample may be more representative of the wider cancer survivor population. Um, Spearman's row and linear regression revealed a very strong positive association between FCR1 and FCRISF scores with a um, coefficient of 0.82. This means that the FCR1 score is a good predictor of FCRISF scores. Um, and this indicates that the FCR1 demonstrates criterion validity and suggests that in clinical settings um, where shorter measures are required, the FCR1 may be a good substitute for the FCRISF. Um, the correlations observed between FCR1 scores and the related constructs of anxiety, intrusive thoughts, and negative metacognitions are comparable to what was observed in the literature. Um, and we can also see that measurements that should not be related, such as annual income, marital status, and employment status, were also not found to be correlated in this study. So this indicates that the FCR1 does appear to um, capture FCR severity, and it does demonstrate construct validity. Um, the ROC analysis revealed an area under the curve of 0.9, um, this indicates that the FCR1 has an outstanding ability to discriminate between positive and negative cases of clinical FCR. Um, the ROC curve also allows us to compare the sensitivity and specificity of different cutoff points. Um, as a preliminary screening tool, um, the score of five or more seems the most suitable um, with high sensitivity and moderate specificity. Um, a cutoff score of six or more can also be chosen if the objective was to maximize specificity. Um, for example, if we were evaluating a patient's suitability for more intensive therapy or for specific research purposes. Um, and how does the FCR1 perform when compared to other brief measures of FCR, such as the CARQ4 and the CWS6, um, which are four item and six item measures of FCR respectively. Um, and we can see that the revised FCR1 showed the highest correlation coefficient with the gold standard FCRISF. Um, its AUC value is high and its sensitivity and specificity are quite comparable to the other measures as well. 
we can see overall that the FCR1 performs at a similar standard with the other brief measures of FCR, but it also has the added benefit of it being a single item measure. Um, therefore, we think that there is utility in, in the further research and development of a one item screening measure. Um, and when we compare it to the original study with Barty et al in 2020, we can see that the revised FCR1 performs similarly, um, but also better in almost all the areas assessed. Please note that there are differences in methodology that have contributed to this dis discrepancy. Um, but we still think that the revised FCR1 is probably delivered in a more clinically relevant format and that future um, development and evaluation should focus on the revised FCR1. Um, a limitation of our study was its small sample size. Um, and another limitation was lack of consensus amongst researchers on a true gold standard measure of FCR. So despite the FCR SF being one of the most widely used measures, it is still another self-report measure without a sensitivity and specificity of one. Um, future research should use a more stringent gold standard measure. Um, so the semi-structured interview on FCO has been suggested as more stringent a measure because it evaluates FCO severity according to clinical judgment. Um, more ideally, consensus on a gold standard measure of FCR should first be reached and that can be used instead. Um, and lastly, future research should also assess the test retest re reliability of the FCR1 and it could also develop translated versions of the FCR1 and assess its performance in clinical settings. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, these are my references. Um, and are there any questions? All right, thanks so much, Winston. Um, yeah, great piece. I should commend Winston for um, you know getting this work done in a very short period of time. Um, under the challenges of COVID. So um, yeah, well done. And I can see uh, that Joe Shaw uh, has a question. Thanks, Joe. Oh, great study. Really, really nice study. Um, one question I had um, with incorporating the FCRI into the ESAS, um, did you notice whether or not, um, well, I guess you can't notice whether or not it actually changed responses on the other items of the ESAS? Um, I think that, um, so we haven't, I haven't done any analysis regarding that. Yeah, but I do think that that's a good area to look into. Yeah. Yeah, as I was asking, I was thinking, oh, you didn't do the retest. Yeah, yeah. That's probably a really, that, that would be interesting to look at whether or not there was a change on the other ESAS items. Right, because there's a subjects of comparison as well. So yeah, that might change the answers. Yeah. Yeah. So they may be because uh, what I was thinking as as you were because I think it's such a great idea of incorporating it into the ESAS. The one thing I thought about was did having the question at the top of the ESAS mm -hmm. um, actually right. um, sort of frame? Did people then frame their interpretation of subsequent questions? more negatively. So they um, overestimated the severity of say nausea because they're thinking about their FCR. Right, right. Yeah, that is an interesting over research, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that would be very interesting to look at. Um, yeah, I guess we, we just put it at the top of the ESAS because I mean, it was the primary um, item we were interested in, but uh, it would be great to, to look at that in, in further research, like how the ordering uh, impacts on responses, uh, definitely. And I should say that if anybody is interested in um, contributing data to further analysis of the FCR1, um, please get in touch. And it'd be great to, I guess, pull data using this item to, to try and further test its validity and answer some of those questions. Um, but thanks again, Winston. Um, great, pre another great presentation. Um, and next up, we have uh, Saruja Jagathis. Uh, well done. Our, um, we're bang on time, so we'll, we'll keep going. Um, our next speaker is uh, Purva Pradhan, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney School of Psychology under the supervision of Professor Louise Sharp, uh, Professor Phyllis Budo, and Dr. Gemma Todd. And her current project is focusing on cancer survivorship issues and in particular aims to examine cognitive biases in relation to fear of cancer occurrence. 
uh, among cancer survivors. And that's what we're going to be hearing about today. Thank you, Purva. Thanks, Ben. I uh, just wanted to confirm if everyone can hear me and as well as can see the screen. Yep. Yep, yeah, awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Purva, PhD candidate at School of Psychology. And today I'm going to be talking about my PhD research paper, which is on the testing the threat interpretation model of FCR in women with breast cancer. And I'd like to acknowledge all co-authors and Breast Cancer uh, Network Australia for recruiting participants. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. I'm currently on the land of Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So today I'm going to be talking basically about the background of the, uh, of the study, which leads to hypothesis, uh, methodology, results, and finally conclusions. So according to Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, there has been a significant rise in cancer survivorship rate during last five years. And this is particularly for cancers that are diagnosed at an early stage, such as breast cancer, wherein survival rates are as high as 90%. As a result, there has been an increase in focus of survivorship issues. And one of the topmost survivorship issues here of cancer recurrence or progression. And as has been stated earlier, this is basically a fear, worry, or concern about cancer coming back or progressing. And this is a quote from a breast, uh, from a breast cancer survivor which highlights that fear of cancer recurrence or progression is such an important issue. And in many qualitative studies, this fear has been referred to as the sort of Democles. And in the literature, fear of cancer recurrence or progression has also been associated uh, with depression, anxiety, post-traumatic st uh, stress symptoms, and impairing overall quality of life, which leads to increase in healthcare costs. So therefore, uh, in the literature, there, uh, there have been several attempts to explain the conceptual nature of fear of cancer recurrence. And recent theoretical models not uh, only focus on the content of concerns, but they also focus on the cognitive processes. And one such attempt is cancer threat interpretation model. So the model begins with pain, which demands interpretation that is cancer threat or no cancer threat. And this interpretation depends on the individual's cancer history, current context, and the interaction between two, that is, uh, is my current pain similar to the previous cancer pain when it was initially diagnosed? And it's here when this uncertainty emerges. That is, if a cancer threat is determined, there will be a biased attention, fear and worry, and they will in terms in, uh, amplify the pain experience. And therefore, uh, in this model, interpretation of ambiguous stimuli or interpretation bias is being argued to be a central and causal mechanism in clinical levels of fear of cancer recurrence. And according to information processing model, this key bias is called interpretation bias. And this is being defined as uh, interpreting stimulus ambiguity as threatening. So for cancer specific example, a breast cancer survivor may misinterpret a benign acne or breast as a cancerous outgrowth. So uh, there has been a large body of literature which suggests that these biases do play a key role in developing and maintaining anxiety disorders. And in the literature, fear of cancer recurrence is being largely referred to as cancer-specific anxiety. However, uh, both fear of cancer recurrence and interpretation biases have rarely been studied together. But uh, in the literature, there has just been one study which directly assess interpretation biases in the context of fear of cancer recurrence in ovarian cancer survivors. So this study confirmed that people with ovarian cancer had larger interpretation biases than those without cancer, and that interpretation biases were associated with both symptom burden and fear of cancer recurrence. However, interpretation biases did not moderate the relationship between symptoms and fear of cancer recurrence as the threat interpretation model suggested. And therefore, uh, this study partially supported this cancer threat interpretation model. 
So in ovarian cancer, as pain isn't the most common indicator of fear of cancer recurrence, whereas in breast cancer, pain is the most common indicator. So the outcome major in this study was fear of progression rather than uh, fear of cancer recurrence, as the model specifically talks about fear of cancer recurrence rather than fear of progression. And as the original uh, cancer threat model was developed for early stage cancers with better prognosis and for people in remission, therefore we decided to extend our ovarian cancer study to breast cancer survivors by, rep by first, firstly by replicating uh, the methods in a group of women with breast cancer rather than ovarian cancer, secondly, including a larger sample, and thirdly, uh, including majors of both fear of cancer recurrence and fear of progression. So following hypotheses were generated. So the firstly, compared to women with non-clinical fear of cancer recurrence, women with uh, clinical uh, fear of cancer recurrence will exhibit higher interpretation biases and will have greater pain-specific symptoms. Secondly, interpretation bias will moderate the relationship between pain-specific symptoms and fear of cancer recurrence. And thirdly, interpretation bias will continue to predict interpreta uh, independent variants in fear of cancer recurrence, even after controlling for other theoretically relevant variables. So uh, moving on to the methodology of the study. Uh, this was a cross-section study and we recruited 147 women with breast cancer and participants filled out some uh, demographic questions, disease specific questions, ambiguous use tasks and physical symptoms inventory for assessing their pain specific symptoms. So for assessing interpretation bias, we employed ambiguous cues task, wherein participants were instructed to write down the first word that would come into their mind when they read a particular word. So for example, an ambiguous word growth. This may be interpreted as a plant growth for some people. And uh, however, a cancer patient may interpret this as a tumor. As a tumor. So moving on to the results. Uh, in terms of cancer stage, more than two thirds of women had early stage cancer, that is uh, stage one and stage two. And more than 70% of the women reported that they were in remission and had no history of cancer recurrence. And also a majority of them were in clinical range of fear of cancer recurrence. So uh, our group differences, so our first finding uh, in terms of group differences between a uh, high versus low fear of cancer recurrence was that women in clinical uh, fear of cancer recurrence range comparatively had high interpretation bias and pain specific symptoms as compared to women in non-clinical range. And we also performed a Pearson's product moment correlation analysis to inform our moderated analysis and the analysis revealed that there was a significant moderate association between uh, interpretation bias, fear of cancer recurrence, and pain-specific symptoms. And therefore, we performed moderation analysis to test the cancer threat interpretation model. And uh, our finding indicated that both symptom burden and interpretation biases predicted fear of cancer recurrence and the interaction term also significantly predicted fear of cancer recurrence, indicating that interpretation bias did not, uh, uh, indicating that uh, interpretation bias did actually moderate the relationship between uh, pain specific symptoms and fear of cancer recurrence. And uh, this graph basically demonstrates that as interpretation bias increases, the relationship between pain specific symptoms and fear of cancer recurrence also increases. And when pain specific symptoms are low, so fear of cancer recurrence remains low, regardless of the degree to which women interpret ambiguous information as threatening. However, when pain specific symptoms are moderate to high, fear of cancer recurrence levels increase as the degree of interpretation bias increases. And uh, finally, our results also showed that cancer status added 20% of the variance in step one of the model and other uh, important theoretically relevant variables added 34% in step two. And finally, interpretation, uh, by interpretation bias added only 2.4% to the variance in step three. Uh, 
So moving on to the conclusions. Uh, firstly, people with clinical uh, levels of fear of cancer recurrence interpreted ambiguous words in an illness, uh, in an illness relevant manner more than people with non-clinical fear of cancer recurrence. And secondly, our findings also supports the prediction arising from cancer threat interpretation model. So in that, uh, both uh, interpretation bias and pain symptoms predicted fear of cancer recurrence, but the relationship between pain-specific symptoms and fear of cancer recurrence was larger amongst those with moderate to high levels of interpretation bias. And amongst those with the lowest levels of interpretation bias, uh, pain and uh, fear of cancer recurrence were not significantly related. And there's a number of possible reasons why the model might uh, have been better supported in a breast cancer sample rather than an ovarian cancer sample. So firstly, uh, as in most fear of cancer recurrence research, the current sample included women with breast cancer, wherein the majority of the participants were in remission and had been treated with curative uh, intent. And it may be that the cancer threat interpretation model was originally developed to explain fear of cancer recurrence in survivors and uh, successfully, and the survivors should be successfully treated with a curative intent. And uh, in the breast cancer context, as compared to a ovarian cancer context, wherein survivors are initially not treated with curative content. Secondly, in our ovarian cancer study, we measured fear of progression rather than uh, fear of cancer recurrence and prevailing definitions of both fear of cancer recurrence conflate these two constructs, which Dellen will describe later. And finally, in breast cancer, one of the primary symptoms of, of recurrence is pain. That is uh, when the cancer has particularly been spread to bone. And wherein, uh, whereas in ovarian cancer, uh, it is more commonly associated with fatigue and gastrointestinal symptoms. And most uh, importantly, interpretation bias continued uh, continue to independently predict variants in fear of cancer recurrence over and above other known predictors, even when other theoretically important constructs were controlled for. So in summary, interpretation biases were associated with clinical levels of fear of cancer recurrence, and symptoms and fear of cancer recurrence were associated only when interpretation bias were, was high. And therefore, it supports, it completely supports cancer threat interpretation model. And finally, it raises the question whether or not we can manipulate these biases to reduce or to manage clinical levels of fear of cancer recurrence. Thank you. Thank you, Purva. Um, fantastic presentation. Uh, really interesting work looking at fear of recurrence from a slightly different perspective. Um, and there's a couple of questions from Lisa Gretsch here. Just wondering um, if, where, did you measure or control for um, other kind of psychological comorbidities like depression and whether people were taking um, antidepressants? Um, yeah, so uh, we didn't measure uh, any sort of depression or any sort of psychopathologies per se. Specifically, we measured uh, fear of cancer recurrence or fear of progression. But yeah, so we didn't measure, uh, so we didn't measure or control for depression in the study. Can you perhaps just talk very briefly about um, what modulating these threats uh, or interpretation biases might look like in a in a clinical kind of setting? Yeah. So, uh, where uh, as cancer is a potentially life-threatening illness. So worry about potential recurrence is a normal, but to the extent wherein it becomes uh, so de uh, deliberating to the patient. So that is our study concluded that interpretation bias, specifically in terms of interpreting symptoms, which is relevant to the recurrence of a particular cancer, uh, which this model originally posits. And uh, this was the reason why this model was not uh, being supported with ovarian cancer, wherein we still specifically measure fatigue and gastrointestinal symptoms. And here we measure pain specific symptoms. So that's the reason why uh, uh, people were misinterpreting those sort of symptoms in the sample. Uh, I hope this answers your question. 
Yeah, kind of. Um, and I guess it, it means we need to be conscious of those things when we're um, yeah, offering treatments for people with different types of cancer. Um, yeah. Definitely. Thank, thank you, Purva. Um, we'll move on now to our last presentation, uh, lucky last, which is from uh, Dalen Kutzbein, who's currently studying a Master's of Clinical Psychology at the University of Sydney alongside a PhD um, under Professor Louise Sharp. Uh, and he's looking at fear of how fear of cancer occurrence and progression relates to mental health issues um, rather than physical health issues as he um, studied to some degree in his honours project. So we're going to uh, get a, I think, a brief summary of his results now. Thanks, Dalen. Thanks for that um, introduction, Ben. I'll just get my slides up. I'm just so I'll be presenting my honors research today and as well um this mic can be a bit funky so if it starts getting staticky just someone shout out me in the chat box and I'll try and fix it but hopefully we'll be okay um the title of this project was uh, fear of cancer recurrence and fear of cancer progression distinct constructs and I'd like to thank my current and um, previous supervisor Professor Lee Sharp as well as everyone else that was involved with the project including um Porva, Hayley Russell, Dr Lauren Heathcote and Dr Daniel Costa. Obviously, we've talked a lot about fear of cancer recurrence today, so I'll yeah, try and keep it a bit brief. But I would like to draw your attention again to the definition that's come up in a couple of the presentations, and in this one too, of course, that fear of cancer recurrence is a fear, worry, or concern relating to the possibility that cancer will recur or progress. Um, it's, it's been said often today as well, of course, that this is a completely normal or rational response to being diagnosed and living with a potentially life threatening illness. Not something to be pathologized in and of itself, but it's something that can certainly become problematic in a clinical context and something that is worthy of research and is often cited as an unmet need that um, cancer survivors need. As this sort of uh, the importance of this constructs become more broadly recognized, there's been a proliferation of theoretical models that aim to account for fear of cancer recurrence under that definition. And um, our research was sort of most interested in the Fidel at, uh, um, Fidel colleagues model, and that was because this model was based on a systematic review and has since gone on to be the basis for Fungafia, which we can talk a little bit about today, um, intervention which is shown to be effective at reducing fear of cancer recurrence in randomized controlled trials. This model in particular um, proposes that Intrusive thoughts about cancer are a normal response to diagnosis and adjustment to life with cancer. However, when a person believes that these intrusions or their worries about cancer are particularly helpful, harmful, or uncontrollable, in other words, that they have unhelpful metacognitions, they will engage in this cognitive attentional syndrome that um, prevents the natural dissipation of FCR over time. This syndrome is characterized by a worry and rumination, attentional bias, use things like that towards bodily sensations and other potential indicators of a cancer recurrence. Although this model has not been formally tested, um, it was again based on a systematic review and the aforementioned Concafia RCT actually demonstrated that reductions in fear of cancer recurrence are partially mediated by um, reductions in maladaptive metacognitions and intrusive thoughts, which gives some evidence to their role in FCR and um, as treatment mechanisms, of course. However, there is a significant conceptual issue at play here. The, the current definition of fear of cancer recurrence conflates both recurrence and progression. It assumes that a fear of cancer recurrence, FCR, and a fear of progression, FOP, are equivalent constructs, despite there being no actual evidence to support this claim. And because of this conflation and the fact that models of FCR don't tend to distinguish between people with active and non-active disease, almost all the psychological interventions for FCR have been evaluated with disease-free early stage cancer patients who have been treated with curative intent. You know, these are the people who conceptually at least would likely fear a recurrence. Whereas FOP, that fear of progression is perhaps most relevant to those with metastatic cancer or for those whose cancers already recurred were notably far more absent from the literature than their early stage counterparts. And this distinction and this conflation um, 
is quite important because if FCI and FOP are equivalent as the current sort of definition and understanding in the literature states, I mean, that's great. Effective interventions for FCR can be applied broadly across the cancer spectrum and target fears of progression with no problems. However, if FCI and FOP are different, then perhaps that suggests that differentially targeting psychological factors when working with different cancer groups would optimise clinical treatment of these people. Hence, our study aimed to address this gap by exploring whether or not fear of cancer recurrence and fear of progression are empirically equivalent as currently proposed and whether or not they can be accounted for by the same theoretical model, the other model in this case. Um, we used a sort of two-phase design for this study, and I'll go into it in more detail, but just a little flag, I suppose. We used um, factor analytic and structural equation modeling techniques. Um, in terms of recruitment, we, with the help of Ovarian Cancer Australia and Breast Cancer Network Australia, we recruited 354 people with a history of breast or ovarian cancer, some of whom were in remission, some of whom were in treatment, and some of whom had active disease across numerous stages, one through four. Um, this was a survey-based study as well, of course. To collect information about the FCR, we could use the FCRI severity subscale, a short-form measure of um, fear of cancer recurrence. And we measured the fear of progression. We used the short-form fear of progression questionnaire. Both these measures um, have previously been deemed to be highly validated and are quite common throughout the literature as well as anyone in this area. Um, the patient who's done work in this area would know. Um, we also use questionnaires to assess participants' intrusive thoughts about cancer, uh, metacognitions, propensity to body to monitor the body for threat. That's that cognitive attentional syndrome I mentioned before. And of course, as well, um, subjective perception of risk in terms of how likely is it that I will have a recurrence or progression of my cancer. Um, so in terms of that first phase, that factor analysis, we conducted an exploratory factor analysis, entering in all the items from the FCRI severity subscale and all the items from the FOP questionnaire into a single analysis and looked at how each item would load. For these analyses, there were two mutually exclusive outcomes that we sort of suspected to occur. First being, of course, that one factor is extracted where FCR and FOP items both load positively onto a single factor. This would suggest that the questionnaires are measuring the same construct and thus suggest that FCR and FOP are themselves equivalent, at least in measurement. Um, second outcome, of course, being that two factors would be extracted, whereby FCR and FOP items load onto separate factors, which may or may not be correlated, which would again suggest that each questionnaire is actually measuring something different and that FCR and FOP are not entirely equivalent. And in phase two, we did some structural equation modeling that was a little contingent on the preceding results. But again, I'll just sort of skip over that sort of stuff and, and get straight into it. Um, in terms of the exploratory factor analysis, this is a visualization of that analysis when we ran it. And based on the coalescence of different extraction methods, it was very clear um, for our data that it was best characterized by a two factor solution. Um, we can clearly see that the purple shaded items, those belonging to the FOP questionnaire, clearly cluster along a different factor line compared to the yellow shaded items, those belonging to the FCR questionnaire. As we uh, interpreted, it, interpreted these respective factors as fear of progression and fear of cancer recurrence. Um, and these two factors accounted for approximately half the variance in the participants responding across the questionnaires. Um, we also noted that they were moderately correlated as well, and they were not entirely distinct in that sense. Um, importantly, the, the, it was really striking how well these two questionnaires divided along factorial lines. Only three items cross-loaded across these factors, and if we take a closer look at them, it actually kind of makes a bit of conceptual sense as to why they'd cross-load. Um, one of the items here, you know, um, I become anxious if I think my disease may progress, cross-loads because FOP itself is moderately correlated with FCR. The statement, I am nervous prior to a doctor's appointment, that is relevant for both cases of disease progression and recurrence, people having contact with health professionals across their disease spectrum. And lastly, when I think about the possibility of cancer recurrence, this triggers other unpleasant thoughts or images such as death, suffering, and so on. Whilst this item does explicitly refer to recurrence, the notion of unpleasant thoughts and images, I mean, that's just intrusive thoughts, right? So that's something that um, can as well appear conceptually relevant to both fears of progression and fears of recurrence across the disease spectrum. 
So in summary, all this sort of suggests that the FCRI severity subscale and the FFPQSF are measuring distinct but positively correlated constructs, which indicates that FCR and FFP themselves are similar but distinct in some way. Importantly, this does not seem to be an artifact of people in remission not endorsing items about progression and those with active disease not endorsing recurrence items. As we actually surprisingly found that people with active disease are more likely to endorse both uh, fear of cancer recurrence and progression over and above those with uh, non-active disease, which, had, which does corroborate previous findings as well. So because of these findings, again, that FCR and FOP are similar but distinct, and appear to be endorsed irrespective of disease status, we entered them both into a single structural equation model um, that was sort of approximating the core processes of the heart of the fibro model, and that's the, uh, the analysis pictured here. This is what we get when we run it, and there's sort of a lot going on here. It would take a lot of time to go through all the different indirect effects and whatnot, so I'm just going to sort of hone in on the three most salient findings um, from our perspective. And that is that intrusions and metacognitions are both significant and similarly strong predictors of both FCR and FOP. And if you remember back to the FIDO model, these are two key processes, processes which has also been implicated in uh, as treatment mechanisms for the reduction of FCR, and it seems that they are also quite relevant for FOP, at least to a similar degree. Another interesting finding is that risk perception is a significant predictor of both, again, FCR and FOP, but that the relationship is actually st significantly stronger for FCR. So it suggests that risk perception is important for FOP, but uh, to a far lesser extent than it is for FCR. Lastly, um, one's propensity to monitor the body for threat, that cognitive attentional syndrome, only predicts FCR, does not in fact predict FOP at all, which suggests that you know, the degree to which one is scanning their body for signs and symptoms of a recurrence or progression and interpreting them in such a way doesn't entirely relate to the severity um, of experienced FOP, which is again, sort of surprising in some sense. So again, overall, whilst our findings suggest that FCR and FOP are similar, they are, not, uh, they are distinct in measurement, they are not entirely predicted by the same psychological factors. And we would argue that this distinction, um, as small as it sort of may appear perhaps on the surface, it, that it is actually quite critical to providing optimal psychosocial care for cancer survivors. You know, since um, intrusions and metacognitions are strong predictors of both fears, it is plausible that these interventions which target um, these cognitions would be effective for both. This suggests that you know, something like conquer fear could be adequately translated to treat FOP, and I'm sure there'd be quite good outcomes there. However, since there are differences between them, it wouldn't be surprising if uh, different interventions were optimal for each, rather than a sort of broad strokes approach. Um, as an example, given that risk perception is far less relevant in predicting FOP, it is possible that more traditional cognitive behavioral therapy techniques that challenge a person's risk beliefs would be um, more effective in the case of FCR, where risk perception is such, again, a stronger uh, predictor. So perhaps contemporary CBT interventions like conquer fear could be actually augmented with some of these traditional techniques if FCR is the focus of the client. And similarly, um, reappraisal of somatic symptoms may be less effective in treating FOP, whereas they would be effective for FCR in light of our um, the findings of our model. Also, since the literature has treated FCR and FOP as synonymous, research has tended to focus on FCR and those with early stage cancer. So in practice, our fears of progression are actually kind of poorly understood. Um, just one example, uh, a quite highly cited systematic review of quantitative research on FCR, the um, Simard and colleagues paper from 2013 that uh, captured 130 studies only 13 of which actually used FOP as an outcome measure. Similarly, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials for the treatment of FCR captured 23 trials, only three of which included FOP as an outcome measure. So the literature actually tells us vastly more about FCR than it does about FOP. Again, these are similar constructs. We can perhaps you know, um, draw some conclusions about each, but again, that's an assumption, something that um, our research suggests would actually need to be tested more explicitly. Um, it's also possible, you know, that there are other variables not assessed in the study that may further distinguish FOP from FCR, which may in turn, again, reveal further fear-specific treatment targets to optimize psychosocial care. And we sort of hope that 
um, with this distinction, this conflation being eroded a little bit, challenged by this study, that we can develop these new uh, fear-specific interventions or adapt established ones to more effectively reduce the significant psych uh, psychological burden of fearing a recurrence or progression of one's cancer. That's the end. Sorry, <laughs> fantastic presentation, Dalen. Um, we're well, a minute or two over time, but. Um, I was, was trying to just <laughs> go through it. <laughs> no, no, well done. I think yeah, we were running one or two minutes behind time. Uh, my fault, but um, perhaps you can just tell us a little bit. Um, do you think there's any refinement of the FCR or FOP measures needed based on your results? Like, should we try and evaluate whether cross-loading items should be removed or? Yeah. Mm, that's a that is a good question. If I recall correctly. Um, I haven't looked at the, the raw data in a while, but the cross loads weren't completely equal across each factors. They were predominantly loading with their respective questionnaires. There was just this small cross loading. Right. Um, it is it is an interesting thought though. I think um, certain items you probably couldn't remove, like the I fear my cancer will progress, feels fairly at the core of the questionnaire, but um, it would be interesting to see if you could actually tease those two apart in the questionnaires. Perhaps yeah, some refinement. Great. Um, well, thanks for another great presentation. Good luck for your PhD as well. Look forward to hearing more as that progresses. Um, and thanks to all our presenters for a fantastic session today um, and everyone who joined. Appreciate you taking the time out from your uh, routine on a Friday um, late in the year. Um, so thank you again. And uh, as mentioned, the recording of this session will be up on the POCO YouTube channel um, shortly. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.